Ever wondered what would be on the king's menu in medieval England? Take a look at one of the oldest English cookbooks, The Form of Curry, and see what Richard II was having for dinner in this week's episode of Footnoting History. Hi, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm your host, Kristen. And today, we're going to step into a medieval kitchen, where almond milk and spices abound, where dishes called crispies and noombles are on the menu. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm studying the past, I always want to know what people were eating for dinner, how they made it, and where they got the ingredients. And I wonder, could I make it too? The 14th century English recipe collection known as The Form of Curry is, in many ways, a wonderful resource for this information. There are hundreds of ingredients, plenty of dishes to choose from, some instructions, and a few questions. The Form of Curry is a culinary recipe collection, and it's one of the first written in English. It comes to us from the court of Richard II, who ruled between 1377 and 1399. Richard II is perhaps most famous for his role in the 1381 Peasants' Revolt, and then later getting himself deposed. He often takes the blame for starting the War of the Roses in England, which was a civil war fought between two branches of the House of Plantagenet, Lancaster and York, symbolized by a red rose and a white rose. Richard certainly had his failings as king, but his kitchen was on point. In the medieval world, food did a lot of work. In a royal court like Richard's, food was about wealth and health and enjoyment and display. It was about keeping people happy and compensating them for their service and loyalty. It was a statement about prosperity, and it was about putting on a show. It was about eating food that was considered appropriate to a person's station in life and their physical well-being. In the Christian calendar, there were times of fasting and certain days of the week where some foods were off-limits. And conversely, there were times of feasting with musicians and performers. What was served at the table could say quite a lot, but not many medieval sources talk directly about how the food all came together. The topic of food does come up quite a bit in a variety of sources, but recipe books as we tend to think of them, with dishes organized by type, with ingredients and amounts carefully laid out, step-by-step instructions, and a clear indication of what the whole thing should look and taste like at the end, These things were only just beginning to take their shape in the later Middle Ages in Europe. Because food was strongly associated with a person's health, scholastic medical texts do sometimes give us a glimpse of what people were eating, or at least what their academically trained physicians were recommending that they eat, and not eat, for their health. And while it is all very theoretical and interesting, there isn't much advice on how to prepare these things. Other regulatory measures, things like household accounts, manorial records, and laws about selling animals, produce, and cooked items, also mention what people ate. And there are also casual references to food and literature where food is part of the scene. There are King Arthur stories, and there is some poetry that talks about banquets and the different types of food served and in what order. But none of these things can really be considered forerunners to our modern-day cookbooks because They're not discussing the preparation of the food, and they're not written for easy reference, and the food is not the sole point of these texts. Manuscripts with recipes for food were not terribly common in Europe for much of the Middle Ages. Things like religious texts and government bureaucratic records were preferred in the later 11th and early 13th centuries, and some things were slower to move away from an oral tradition. During this period in England, literacy and scribal culture was growing, And while it would take Europe as a whole quite some time to catch up to the ruling classes, they were starting to get there by the tail end of the Middle Ages. By the later 1400s, it was far more than religious and governmental records, and the use of the vernacular was growing. People were starting to write more personal letters and calendars, and many kept their own little notebooks called commonplace books that contained landscaping, fishing, and farming advice, as well as medical and culinary recipes. Commonplace books had all kinds of things in them, and oftentimes those things were recipes, but their purpose was to be a catch-all for useful information, and they were not just recipes. The first text to resemble something of a modern cookbook, with 
some organization and itemization, tends to fall on the French culinary manuscript called Le Viander, which translates into a provider of hospitality or a provisioner. In other words here, a really fancy cook. This fancy cook is sometimes assumed to be a man named Guillaume Tyrell, who worked in the royal kitchens of Charles V and Charles VI. Tyrell has the amazing medieval nickname Televon, which means the wind slicer. But the text was written a little earlier than the wind slicer's time, at the end of the 13th century, and is actually anonymous, like most medieval culinary texts. Even though Le Viander was often bound together alongside other texts in a single manuscript, it was all about the culinary recipes, and it is something of a prototype for the Western European cookbook. After Le Viander, more things like it started to appear. To date, historians have identified about 100 such manuscripts, from the 1300s and the 1400s, from Italy, Spain, Scandinavia, France, Germany, and England, and the form of curry is one of the longer and more famous of these texts. The form of curry is named after its very first line. Most medieval manuscripts don't have titles in the way that we are used to having a volume with a title, and so this is how they are often identified and where they get their names. The form of curry means the proper method of cookery, and it opens by stating that this proper method of cookery was compiled by the master cooks of Richard II in collaboration with court physicians and philosophers, and it was considered the best around. Richard's household accounts claim to feed 10,000 people every day, and that may not have been a complete exaggeration given the general scale of medieval royal households and all the work that went into making them run. Richard's household would have moved with him as he traveled his kingdom, but the infrastructure would have been largely similar in the various places where he stayed. There would have been several fireplaces and a bread oven. Ovens were rather specialized pieces of cooking equipment. They required a lot of resources and attention and skill to properly use, but the form of curry has several recipes for bread and pastries that require baking. Most villages would have had a baker where people would take their dough to be baked every day, or they would use a Dutch oven on their home hearth. But Richard's kitchen would have had an oven for baking, along with a water supply, a few spits for roasting meat, giant pots for stewing, pans for frying, and kitchen utensils like mortars and pestles and knives and slotted spoons and rolling pins. There are a tremendous number of recipes that call for meat or fish of some kind. Royal kitchens often had their own livestock pens, gardens, ponds, and breweries, not to mention storehouses of goods to draw upon when making food for thousands of people every day. And the form of curry shows us what these people were eating. The form of curry's introductory segment claims that the pages that follow will teach the reader how to make simple, complicated, and really complicated dishes. The collection claims that it's outset to be for all walks of life, quote, both high and low, end quote, underscoring the medieval belief that some dishes were only suited to certain types of people. The introduction closes with the promise that this collection will, quote, teach a man without tarrying to find what food he longs to have, end quote. Well, I'm intrigued. There are 205 recipes in the form of curry, and there's something for everyone. There are meat and vegetable dishes, soups and stews and roasts, savory and sweet dishes. There are a tremendous number of spices, ranging from salt and pepper, to ginger and cloves and nutmeg. Salt and pepper were rather ubiquitous items in the medieval West. Europeans did not know the joys of pepper, not until Marco Polo traveled to India and Southern Asia in the 13th century, but once they had a taste, they were hooked. Culinary historian Melita Weiss Adamson calls pepper the most common spice in medieval Europe, and people used all kinds of it. They used black pepper, white pepper, and long pepper. The French tended to favor long pepper, but the English actually liked cubeb. Cubeb, sometimes also called java pepper, is related to black pepper, and it is a touch spicier. As an island kingdom, England produced and traded a fair amount of sea salt, thanks to its marshy coasts and salt hills. The pepper had to be imported, but it was still pretty accessible. 
The economic historian John Monroe estimates that a pound of pepper could set back a skilled London craftsman a little more than two days' wages in the 15th century. Which was a lot of money, but medieval people spent a higher proportion of their income on spices than we do today. And though they could cost a lot, spices were not only for kings. A lot of the ingredients in the form of curry are probably familiar to Western cooks, but there are a few things that are a little less common in the Western modern kitchen. Like cubeb. And like gallingale, which is a root similar to ginger and found often in Thai cooking. And alkanet, which is a red dye made from a plant and used today in a lot of Kashmiri cooking. There are also ingredients more often found in Persian and Arabic cooking today, like almond milk, rose water, and saffron. These things often made their way into the medieval English kitchen, which is sometimes surprising to modern audiences. Diners often eagerly adopted cooking techniques and tastes from abroad. The form of curry contains French, Italian, and Levantine recipes, like macaron, raviolis, and Saracen sauce, which is a chicken stew made from almonds, rose hips, sugar, rice flour, red wine, alkanet, and pomegranates. Animal milk, usually from cows, but also goats and sheep, was rather common in medieval Europe, but people didn't really drink it. Unless you were using it right away or making cheese or butter from it, dairy milk tended to spoil quickly, unlike almond milk, which lasted far longer. Almonds were grown in the Mediterranean regions of Europe, and while they were often outside the price range of ordinary people, someone like Richard II would have had no trouble getting enough for his table, and almonds show up in over 50 form of curry recipes, in their milk form, but also blanched and unblanched in porridges, flours, and sauces. Richard seems not to have had a strong taste for rose water, but Spain, which had a large Muslim population in the Middle Ages, did enjoy rose water, along with sumac, pistachios, and tamarind. Rose water, which is used in a lot of Indian, Persian, and Arabic cooking today, is made through distillation, which is a process that uses heat to evaporate a liquid and create and collect the condensation. Because it actually is made from flowers, rose water has a very floral scent, and it's often used in desserts, like the sweet cheese tart that is the sole recipe to use rose water in the form of curry. Saffron was much more Richard's speed. It has a unique, delicate taste, and it looks spectacular. Saffron was and remains a very expensive spice because of where it is generally grown, but more so because of how it has to be harvested. Each little gold-orange strand of saffron is either a stigma or a style of a flower, and each little gold-orange strand has to be harvested by hand. It takes between 60,000 to 70,000 strands to make one pound of saffron, and that pound of saffron could cost that skilled London craftsman mentioned earlier about a month's wages. But a lot of people wanted it, Saffron was one of the four major spices that was imported commercially to medieval Europe, along with black pepper, cinnamon, and ginger. Saffron was the only one of these four spices that Europeans began growing themselves. The northern Spanish region of Catalonia acquired a reputation for producing fabulous saffron, but they weren't the only European growers. The English enjoyed saffron so much, they were growing it themselves in Essex, and there is a town named after it called Saffron Walden. Richard II seems to have enjoyed saffron quite a lot, and the spice is in just about half of the form of Curry's recipes. The opening salvo of recipes in this collection are for somewhat humbler appetites. The first dish, called a frumentry, is a kind of porridge made from wheat and sweetened milk. And the dish that immediately follows is also another porridge. This one, called white porridge, is made from onions and leeks and small birds. It's a kind of oatmeal and chicken soup fusion. Next up are more savory stews called pottages. There's one made with beans, one with ground pork, one with cabbage, and then one with turnips. And all of these dishes are indeed of humble origin, pottages most especially. These were essentially stews, and pottages were the mainstay of most people. They were pretty flexible and forgiving in their cooking method. They could be made with the most basic of cooking equipment, earthenware or metal pots set over hot ashes or coals, 
and with simple kitchen ingredients like beans and cabbage and root vegetables. Essentially, you just threw everything into one pot and let it cook all day. But this was a royal kitchen after all, so even these simple recipes got an upgrade. Every one of these recipes but the bean pottage calls for saffron. Medieval people did enjoy their spices, and I have mentioned only a few, but there were other things that they did to make their food taste good. Roasting was another favorite technique, and this required a lot of attention and manpower, and as such, it was usually only done by the upper classes. The royal table would have enjoyed roast meat daily, unless restricted by a time of religious observance, and the form of curry lists several roasts that are often accompanied by pretty complicated sauces, like a recipe for chickens in a hard-boiled egg sauce, roasted pork with coriander, caraway, pepper, garlic, and red wine. There's a lamb in a broth of almonds, cinnamon, sugar, and wine. There are some pretty intricate sauces included in the form of curry, sometimes paired with a meat dish, as with these examples, but also sometimes just on their own. One recipe for a mulberry sauce has the cook blanching almonds, toasting pine nuts, tempering red wine, adding spice blends, and then coloring the whole thing red. The medieval court was often about display, and subtleties were prepared with this in mind. Subtleties were dishes that were really one thing but were made to look like another, things that were prepared to wow those in attendance. The English were known for building giant castles out of dough for the entertainment of diners, but the form of curry tackled items people might actually eat. A recipe for something called cockagrees was designed to seem like a whole new animal. Here, the recipe calls for the top of a chicken to be sewn to the bottom half of a pig, and then the whole thing is stuffed with meatballs, roasted, and then served in a sauce dyed yellow with egg yolks and saffron, and adorned with gold leaf and silver. A little less labor-intensive is a recipe for sausages shaped like hedgehogs. Here, little meatballs made with saffron are stuffed into a casing, parboiled, and then roasted on a spit. There's also a recipe for dried fruits to be disguised as small pieces of meat, which was probably a bit less about showcasing the artistry of the cook and more about getting the royal diners to get excited about something other than meat. The form of curry is a little short on the vegetable dishes, which likely does reflect something of the medieval belief that the upper classes were better suited to digesting meat and lots of spices and complicated sauces. Even on religious fast days, it was acceptable to eat poultry and fish. There are a few vegetarian recipes in the form of curry, some recipes for beans and peas, some egg dishes, some toast with fennel and leeks, applesauce and a few desserts, but there's only one lonely recipe for a salad in this text. Admittedly, it sounds pretty good. It has parsley and sage and borage and mint, fennel and garden cress, rosemary rue, purslane garlic and different kinds of onions, and it's dressed with oil, salt, and vinegar. It sounds like everything from the kitchen herb garden with a little bit of pizzazz. It's the recipe I feel most confident in reproducing, except my American grocery store doesn't carry roux, purslane, or borage. A good number of items that appear in the form of curry are not carried in a lot of Western, especially American grocery stores. Things like pigeons and rabbit and eel. It turns out that noombles are the organ meats of deer and oxen, and my local grocery stores don't have those either. Those crispies mentioned at the beginning of the episode are a little bit more accessible. They're fritters made with white flour, egg whites, and sugar, and then fried in grease, dyed red with alkanet. It's a sweet dish comprised of a few expensive ingredients and made into a startling color, and I tried it. The form of curry says to take your flour and muddle it with egg whites. I interpreted this to mean that I was supposed to beat my egg whites until they were frothy and form stiff peaks, almost like I was making a meringue, and then I folded in the flour. The form of curry then says to take the batter and drop it into hot oil through your fingers or a skimmer. I used my spetzel maker because the point seemed to be to make tiny little drops of batter. I waited until little bubbles appeared in the batter, 
the recipe says to wait until there are, quote, holes therein, and if thou wilt, color it with alkanet, end quote. It didn't say to remove the crispies yet, and I did not have alkanet, but you can buy it online. So I put in a little red food coloring into the oil, and it did dye them a little bit. Finally, the recipe said to remove the crispies from the oil and to toss them in sugar. They were like tiny little funnel cakes. My experience making these crispies from the form of curry probably was in many ways similar to one of Richard II's cooks. I was able to get white flour and sugar and oil and red dye and cooking equipment. I wanted something that tasted good, that I would feel good eating, and that would be impressive. I had to guess at amounts and rely on past experience. At the end, it would have been nice to have a kitchen staff to clean it all up, but recipe texts like the form of curry open a window into the 14th century. They point us toward economic, social, religious, and political experiences that still have resonance today. And you know what? Those Krispies were pretty good. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. From all of us here at Footnoting History, a special thank you to our Patreon supporters. And until next time, remember the best stories are always in the footnotes.